Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am John Maurer, for those of you who don't know me. And today I'm going to talk about the Battle of Jutland because today, May 31st, and into the evening of June 1st, it's the 100th anniversary of the largest naval engagement of the First World War, a celebrated engagement, even though the outcome disappointed both sides in this battle. And what I'm going to do today is give you uh, a strategic appraisal about the battle. I want to put it in a larger strategic context, as well as talk about the battle itself. The battle has many controversies that surround it, and so I want to address some of the most important controversies about the battle, including who won, who lost, uh, and what effects, strategic effects, both more short-term and long-term, grew out of the engagement, and then have some takeaways. Well, Jutland has to be seen in the context of the long tide of history, looking back on British naval dominance, going back to the time of the Napoleonic Wars, the wars in which Alfred Thayer Mahan lectured on over at our war college, over in the, the museum, what is now the museum, and wrote about in his three big volumes on the influence of sea power upon history. And on October 21st, 1805, was the Great Battle of Trafalgar, in which the Royal Navy won a major victory over the combined French and Spanish fleets. And this battle sent something of a, well, a benchmark of what a decisive naval engagement should look like. About two-thirds of the Fran Franco-Spanish fleet uh, was captured or destroyed in the battle. Uh, the commander of the British fleet, Admiral Lord Nelson, became a big hero, of course, died while fighting the battle. In fact, uh, his uh, legacy uh, for the Royal Navy in Britain, he is seen as the savior of his country. And indeed, his last words are celebrated m m in much the same way that people would look at uh, uh, Christ's last words. So here's someone who has become a great hero, become savior of the country by giving of his life to win this big battle over the French and Spanish. Well, the Battle of Trafalgar is seen as conferring on Britain, conferring on Britain, a mastery of the maritime commons for the next hundred years. In one of the books that's widely read now about the Battle of Jutland and the Royal Navy in this time by Andrew Gordon, Rules of the Game, that in 1897, at the time of Queen Victoria's great jubilee, it looked like Britain was still on top of the world, that the Royal Navy with 360 fighting ships was equal to the next five navies combined. Boy, that sounds a lot like today when people compare defense budgets and say, oh, well, the U.S. defense budget or tonnage of the U.S. fleet is equal to the next three or four countries and the rest. It, it looks like a, a, a presence, a strength, that is something that is unassailable, unassailable. Again, the tradition of Trafalgar stretching down to this period of time. Well, of course, that unassailable supremacy was soon to be challenged. In the very next year, there is the first big fleet-building law passed by the German Reichstag. German government, led by Kaiser Wilhelm, has decided to embark on a major naval building program. This is a very famous speech that the Kaiser gave at the end of the 19th century, where he said that the strong fleet is an urgent, or sometimes translated as a bitter need for us, for the German people. The Kaiser put all of his prestige behind building up this fleet. The German historian, famous German historian uh, Friedrich Meinecke, said that the Kaiser was the fleet Kaiser. He led the German people who were very much continental in focus, land power, led them to understand how important it was for Germany to become a sea power. Germany was becoming a great industrial state, technological state, uh, trading state, and it accompany those great achievements in industry and commerce, uh, you also, Germany also needed a powerful fleet. So the Kaiser is very much behind building up this fleet. 
uh, to understand Jutland, the Battle of Jutland, you have to go back at least 20 years, in other words, a generation, to see this buildup that's taking place uh, with the German fleet that is challenging that unassailable supremacy. Now, the Kaiser knew very much what he was doing. One of his top political leaders, a man who becomes chancellor in 1909 and is chancellor at the outbreak of the war, Theobald von bettmann holweg uh, this is what he is telling a friend about what the Kaiser's aim is. First and foremost is that Germany is going to emerge as a world power, a rival to that of Britain on the world stage. Again, the way it's put is they're going to break Britain's position in the world in favor of Germany. The international system in which Britain is really the only superpower is now going to be challenged. The world is moving into a post-British world, a more multipolar world, we might say, in which Germany is one of the leading states of the international system. And to be able to do that, Germany has to have a fleet. A fleet is required for that. More on this in uh, a moment in the aftermath of Jutland. And of course, to have a powerful fleet, a powerful battle fleet, you have to be strong economically. You have to have great industry. And so Germany in this period of time is also industrializing. From 1890 on, you see a remarkable growth in German industry in the post-Bismarck era. And that industry uh, creates the wealth that enables Germany to be able to afford a fleet. Again, Germany has to become rich first, hence priority to industry, as bettmann holweg tells his friend. But then, with that wealth and that industry, to build up a fleet. In 1897, Admiral Tirpitz, who was the architect of the German naval buildup, appointed by the Kaiser in 1897, lays out what's called the Tirpitz Memorandum in June 1897 to lay out the plan for the development of the German fleet. And uh, he picks England as the most dangerous enemy. That's the benchmark. He's not making as a benchmark France, another continental power. He's using as the benchmark the world's leading naval power. That's pretty remarkable. Again, it's not Russia or France that he's building against. It's against Britain. He's setting out the most demanding scenario that you can imagine to challenge the world leader. Well, anyway, it's the enemy, the enemy, notice, that Germany most needs to have a battle fleet. Now, again, he doesn't see it necessarily leading to war. It could also be an instrument, a, a tool for leverage in negotiations with Britain. Again, it's a way of having some force to be able to back up German demands on the world stage. So that, as Chancellor Bulow at this time said, Germans don't like being dictated to by some foreign Jupiter. That foreign Jupiter is Great Britain some godlike figure up there on Olympus that sends down its dictates and everyone else has to obey. Well, no, with a powerful German battle fleet, Jupiter won't be able to dictate anymore. Again, more on that when we get to the Kaiser's speech after the Battle of Jutland. Now, what type of fleet to build? Well, you could build cruisers. You could build a number of types of fleet architecture. but. Tirpitz says you have to have battleships, head-to-head, -head, more of a symmetrical challenge to Britain. Tirpitz was a reader of Mahan, uh, thought that Mahan's uh, theories about sea power and building up of naval power had validity for Germany, believed that Germany, to be competitive against Britain, because it didn't have overseas bases, coaling stations and the rest, uh, that Germany had to build up a fleet of battleships to contest with Britain in home waters in the North Sea. And uh, the Germans very quickly start building a fleet of what we would call pre-dreadnought battleships. Very powerful fleet comes into existence in a very short period of time. And again, Tirpitz highlighted in the memorandum that this is a fleet that's going to fight in the littorals, in close to the German home waters, where Germany will have not just battleships, but also torpedoes, mines, coastal artillery, 
capabilities to be able to wear down an attacking British fleet because it's thought that the Royal Navy, with these traditions of Trafalgar taking the offensive, that the Royal Navy's battle fleet, its grand fleet, will launch an offensive into German home waters. That's what Mahan would predict that it would do. And so the Germans' leadership, Tirpitz in particular, being a follower of Mahan, believes that the, German, uh, that the British are going to undertake an uh, early offensive into German home waters. There is where the f fight will take place, in the southern portions of the North Sea. Well, Britain follows what we would call an offset strategy. If the Germans are doing an area denial anti-axis strategy, we might call it, the British were also following an offset strategy. And this is most closely uh, linked to Admiral Jackie Fisher. And there's a slide of him. I love this portrait of him because it shows a very determined man. You can see his arms crossed there, staring at you, looking you down. Yes, he, he is known for being ruthless within the Navy. You know, it's Jackie Fisher's way or the highway. He does not tolerate or brook opposition. In that sense, he's very much like Tirpitz. Both Tirpitz and Fisher are very determined, opinionated men. They have their views, and they don't like to have people contradict their views. They're pretty confident that they are right. And they surround themselves with other people who agree with them. Uh, and if you can't agree, well, then you're outside, as they said, the fish pond. You're not in Fisher's Pond. Well, he goes ahead with the dreadnought. Uh, dreadnought, very famous story, well known. Uh, well, if the Germans are building pre-dreadnoughts, ships of, say, four 11-inch heavy artillery, the dreadnought is going to be 10 heavy artillery pieces of 12-inch caliber. In other words, a battleship with more than twice the firepower, also greater speed because it has turbines. Uh, this ship can take on and defeat several pre-dreadnoughts. Um, Fisher also pioneers and builds uh, a group of capital ships known as battle cruisers. They're, uh, again, large ships, faster than battleships, less heavily armored. Uh, but with a great deal of firepower as well, eight 12-inch guns. With this speed, you're able to track down, hunt down German armored cruisers or German big steamships, liners, ocean liners that might be converted to cruisers in wartime. Uh, the Invincibles are meant to be able to destroy, mop up, as Fisher said, uh, German cruisers, anyone that would uh, surface ships that would be able to prey on British trade in wartime. Again, very beautiful and powerful uh, ships. And again, here you can see the difference between a pre-dreadnought and the dreadnought. Again, the dreadnought's a much more powerful ship. It's a revolutionary kind of surface ship. Uh, Fisher said, hey, with the dreadnought, all existing battleships, even the most modern, will be practically obsolete. The Germans have invested in this battle fleet. Now what Fisher has done is introduce a new generation of surface ships that uh, is better than the last one. All those ships that Tirpitz has invested in from 1898 down to 1945, uh, they're outclassed. They're outclassed. It won't be a fair fight. In a fight between dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts, the, they're not going to win. Well, uh, what does Germany do? Well, they have the industry and wealth to build dreadnoughts themselves. Now, Fisher hoped that by introducing the dreadnought that he would frustrate the designs not only of Germany but the United States and other naval challengers, that other countries would find it too expensive to follow Britain's lead with dreadnoughts. And this happens in most countries, France, the United States, um, uh, Russia. Uh, but in Germany's case, what Tirpitz does is say, okay, we adapt a plan uh, where we have uh, battleships. We just have to increase the tonnage and build dreadnought battleships. And so they start constructing a fleet of dreadnoughts. Uh, and they're very quick to do it too. Uh, well, what's Britain's response to that? Well, if the Germans are now going to build dreadnoughts, we have to build super dreadnoughts. And if they build super, what's super dreadnought? Again, uh, uh, heavy armament now goes from 12-inch to 13.5-inch guns. Displacement goes up. 
uh, a little bit more powerfully armored. And if the Germans build super dreadnoughts, because they can do that, they have the industry, then we build the fast battleships of the Queen Elizabeth class. So what you're seeing here is part of this offset strategy is Fisher and the Royal Navy are trying to keep one generation ahead of the German challenger at this time. And so what you see in a relatively short period of time of 20 years, you go from displacements of about 15,000 tons and four 12-inch heavy guns to the British were building, uh, wanted to build super hoods by the early 1920s, battleships that would displace about 50,000 tons and have nine 18-inch guns. Very powerful ships. Again, the British strategy is to keep one generation ahead of naval rivals, and in particular, uh, Germany. At the Battle of Jutland, what you're going to see is that the Germans bring uh, three generations of large surface ships. They bring pre-dreadnoughts that had no business being there, by the way, dreadnoughts and super dreadnoughts. The British at Jutland bring dreadnoughts, super dreadnoughts, and fast battleships uh, to the fight. Britain also stays ahead of Germany by building more capital ships than Germany does on a ratio of about three to two, a three to two edge superiority that the British have. But the British are also pioneering in other ways under Fisher. One of the things he does is develop uh, long range submarines. Up to the early part of the 20th century, submarines were used primarily for coastal defense, for defensive purposes. What the British are doing at this time is pioneering submarines that have greater range that now they're more offensive oriented. Their purpose is to go and strike at the enemy in their home waters. Submarines are not now defensive to protect your own home waters. It is with these more powerful submarines to take the fight into the enemy's home waters. And the D-Class is the first overseas submarine. Again, this is one way you can take the offensive into the enemy's home waters without risking battleships, capital ships you can put in play submarines that are seen as being, well, less expensive than uh, battleships. Again, a way of undertaking offensive operations in enemy home waters without having to risk uh, the very expensive battleships. Now, Fisher also in 1906, by 1906, recognizes something else. It's geographic position, again, something that Mahan highlighted. And he talks about what we would call offshore uh, control. Germany is this great trading state, great importer and exporter, but Britain lies athwart uh, German sea lines of communication. As Fisher says, this is a huge breakwater, the British Isles, uh, against German commerce, that the commerce has to go between Scotland and Norway or through the Straits of Dover. And then Britain doesn't have to go in to the southern portion of the North Sea into German home waters to be able to destroy most of Germany's overseas trade. Germany's trade will be limited to the Baltic, to Sweden, by doing this offshore control. And again, it's a unique position of advantage, geographic advantage here, strategic advantage. Uh, Germany has about a thousand merchant ships that ply uh, the world's trade at this time. Uh, what Fisher is arguing is that once this blockade goes into effect, that about 800 German merchant steamers, in other words, 80% of it, is out in the world's ocean. Mm -hmm. They'll be cut off. They'll be cut off at that point. And so they'll be either interned in neutral ports or the British will uh, be able to take them. Again, because of this geographic advantage. In fact, to Fisher, what will be the impact of this on the German economy? Well, it, it'll be worth Paris. In other words, the Germans, through a land campaign, can take Paris, beat the French. But German trade and finance will be so damaged, so damaged by uh, this blockade that it'll be a major blow to Germany, uh, on par with them, the type of damage they're going to inflict upon France. So again, he sees this as being a, um, an important element in an Anglo-German war of being able to hurt Germany by waging this economic warfare. Well, war occurs uh, in 1914, the summer of 1914. The Grand Fleet uh, was on a, a big exercise, maneuvers. Uh, it is sent to its war stations. German battle fleet at the time also goes to its war stations. At the time, the German planners thought 
they ought to try to launch a surprise attack on the British fleet if they can. They wanted to do to the British fleet what the Japanese had done in 1904 in the Russo-Japanese War, uh, a, a sneak attack on the British fleet, and like Japan would do at Pearl Harbor in 1941. But they didn't have good intelligence on the whereabouts of the British fleet, and so they couldn't carry out that attack at the beginning of the, of the war. So what do you have at the beginning of the war? Both fleets are taking up war stations away from each other, and what you have is a stalemate that sets in on the North Sea front. This is the major naval front of the First World War, where the two great fleets, the High Sea Fleet of Germany and the Grand Fleet of Britain. Britain's main naval base is Scapa Flow in the north. It wasn't ready, by the way, at the outbreak of war. And as a consequence, since the base was not secure, the uh, commander of the Grand Fleet, Admiral Jellicoe, uh, had to keep uh, his fleet at sea. Uh, during the fall uh, and early winter mm -hmm. of 1914, the Grand Fleet steamed 16,000 miles. Imagine that. How far you can go in 16,000 miles? That's the voyage of the Russian Baltic Fleet around the Tsushima in the Russo-Japanese War. Again, he did not feel secure in Scapa Flow until all the defenses were put in place and various entrances into Scapa Flow were, were blocked. Again, he only felt secure by being at sea, uh, uh, away from German submarines, because the Germans have also followed British lead, not only in the building of battleships, but now long-range submarines. By the way, Tirpitz didn't like submarines. He, he didn't promote that until the very eve of war. And it's only in 1912 that the Germans start to invest heavily, invest heavily in a submarine force. First, coastal defense submarines, and then the larger submarines for offensive purposes. Well, if you're steaming a lot, one of the things that can happen is that you can run into a mine. And here's the HMS Audacious, which hit a mine uh, while out at sea. This is one of Britain's super dreadnoughts, one of the latest generation of battleships in the British inventory, and yet it goes down to a mine laid by uh, a German um, uh, uh, ship. Uh, the, the sinking of the Audacious, by the way, was captured on film because there was a, an ocean liner that went uh, by and all the passengers in the ocean liner went and said, look at that, there's a ship sinking over there. Uh, and so it was captured and the British, of course, had to quarantine this and prevent the news getting out because they didn't want people to know right away that one of their latest uh, class, uh, one of their latest battleships had just been lost. Uh, Another example of how dangerous and lethal warfare could be, that the big ships could be attacked, was uh, uh, the sinking of the Abacor, Cressy, and Hogue off the coast of the Netherlands. These three armored cruisers were on patrol uh, off the coast of uh, Netherlands. They're hit by one submarine. At first, the first cruiser, uh, it's hit by a, a, a torpedo. It was thought that it was a mine. So the other cruisers decide to slow down and pick up survivors, making them sitting ducks for the German submarine U-9, which then torpedoes the other two. Um, Admiral Fisher would say about this, that in one day, with the sinking of the Abacor, Cressy, and Hogue, these three armored cruisers, that more sailors were lost, killed, than what Lord Nelson lost in all of his battles put together. Again, the reference back to Nelson, the Nelson tradition. Again, everything's being referred back to Trafalgar and to Nelson. That this is a, a catastrophe. Uh, it, it shows that, hey, we're, 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 we're taking heavy losses here. And for what in return? The Dardanelles. On March 18, 1915, there's a major naval assault at the Dardanelles against the Ottoman Empire. Six battleships are mined in that. Three are sunk, again showing the dangers of torpedoes and mines to the big ships. Uh, this weighs heavily on the mind of Admiral Jellicoe. Now, as First Lord of the Admiralty in the period from the outbreak of war 1914 down to the Battle of Jutland, on the right is Winston Churchill. Uh, he would be First Lord of the Admiralty until May 1915 when he was forced to resign, and he was succeeded by Arthur Balfour, who is over there on the left. Arthur, Arthur Balfour is uh, one of the most prominent British politicians in the early part of the 20th century. He had been Prime Minister 
uh, uh, of, uh, of Britain. In fact, he had succeeded his uh, uncle, uh, Lord Salisbury, as prime minister. And when people would say, well, how did he get to be prime minister? They uh, would say, well, Bob's his uncle. Uh, that Lord Salisbury is his uncle, it's all family connections. Well, he becomes First Lord of the Admiralty after uh, Churchill. These are two very powerful political figures. They are both unhappy with the stalemate in the North Sea. They would like to see the Grand Fleet take offensive operations. In other words, revert to a more Mahanian strategy of launching an offensive. When you go through Jellicoe's papers, which are located in the British Library in London, and you go through Balfour's papers, which are also located in the British Library in London, what you see is a correspondence between Jellicoe and Balfour, and also Churchill and, and Jellicoe, in which these two civilian heads of the Royal Navy, the First Lord of the Admiralty, are pushing upon Jellicoe urging him to undertake offensive operations against the German fleet to destroy it, to institute an even closer blockade of Germany. Well, Jellicoe is opposed to that, and this is part of his correspondence writing back to Balfour, and he says, hey, the danger is very real. A disaster could happen in a few minutes without warning. Again, the example, the Abacor Cressy Hogue, the example of the Audacious, the example of six battleships being mined in the Dardanelles attack, damaged or sunk. You could also look to the experience of the Russo-Japanese War, where on May 15, 1904, the Japanese main battle fleet ran across a minefield. Two of the six battleships of the Japanese fleet were sunk that day. One third, in other words, of the capital ship strength of Japan was lost by going over a minefield. Jellicoe is aware of all of this, and so he understands that if his fleet goes over a minefield, a reversal, as he says, could take place that reduces British margin of strength over Germany. That that three to two edge that Britain has in large surface ships could disappear in a day. And what happens? Well, then Britain's whole world position collapses at that point. Again, the existence of the empire is at once in the most immediate and grave danger. Britain's command of the maritime commons could be lost to mines. Well, here's the British blockade, though. It's working its way on the Germans. Jellicoe, by the way, fends off Balfour and Churchill. And he does it in part because the um, uh, naval leadership, uniform leadership, the first sea lord, uh, all back him up. The uniform leaders, by and large, are all on board with Jellicoe's cautious strategy of not launching an offensive into the North Sea, and instead let this blockade do its work against Germany. And it has an impact. This is uh, an estimate put together by modern historians looking at the German economy. And what I've tried to graph here is that at the outbreak of the war, the GDP, the gross domestic product of Britain and Germany, is approximately roughly equal. And under the impact of war, as you can see, both eco economies decline. But Britain's economy uh, recovers. It has access to world markets because of its command of the sea. The British economy actually grows during the First World War. But notice how the German economy uh, takes a dive of 15 to 20 percent, again the estimate, and doesn't recover throughout the war. Whereas Germany and Britain were economic equals at the outbreak of war in 1914, by 1918 they no longer are. You can see the delta there that has emerged. Britain is a stronger economic power relative to Germany by the end of the war. The Germans understand this. Now a lot of this is due to the blockade, not all of it, the German leadership government mismanages the economy in the First World War, another complete topic. But the combination of German mismanagement of the economy plus the blockade has this impact on Germany's economy. And again, over time, there's pressure now being put on the German leadership to do something about this, to break the blockade, or at least make Britain hurt as much, as much as Germany is. And meanwhile, what's the German army doing? It's engaged in very heavy fighting. 1916, in February 1916, the chief of the German general staff, Falkenhayn, opens a large offensive at Verdun, a big battle of attrition on the Western Front. 
attack, counterattack, grisly battles, tens of thousands of men killed. Okay, the Army's doing a lot of heavy fighting. What's the Navy doing? Well, Tirpitz, the architect of the fleet, is frustrated. He wants the fleet to be put in play. He wants it to undertake offensive operations, become more aggressive. And even if the German battle fleet is lost, well, that would be a good thing because at least it will show that the fleet can fight. He's concerned that in the post-war world, when the war is over, when the war is over, if the German battle fleet is not seen as playing an active role when it comes to decisions about force structure and funding, that the army will get all the money and not the navy. Again, he's concerned that the German people understand that Germany is a sea power that needs a powerful navy. Again, Tirpitz always looking of how he can get funding for the navy. It has to show itself as being an important weapon taking part actively in the fighting in this war. Again, talk about a bureaucratic fighter. Here he is. Well, uh, all he does is annoy the Kaiser because the Kaiser is afraid of putting the battle fleet in play. But the pressure grows on the German government, again because of the blockade, again because of the battles on the western and eastern front. Uh, it's thought that the German battle fleet, in which so much has been invested, has to take a more active role. And there's a change of command, and the new admiral takes over. Admiral Reinhard Scheer takes command of the High Sea Fleet. He had been a squadron commander up to this point, and he decides that a more aggressive game plan is called for. Again, sorties by the German fleet into the North Sea that he then hopes will draw the British out from their bases into the North Sea and then by uh, luring them over mines or submarine attacks will somehow whittle down, degrade the British fleet so that eventually the German fleet can fight a battle at odds that uh, will enable it to beat Britain's Grand Fleet. Well, the day for the Germans to tug. Everything is playing up to the day, the big day of battle. And so here we are finally at Jutland. Now what I want to highlight here is that the Battle of Jutland has to be seen in the context of a 20-year-old naval rivalry between Britain and Germany. It just didn't spring up on the day. It's part of a longer-term rivalry between the two countries and the two navies. Well, the German fleet comes out. The British have advanced warning because they have broken German naval codes. They know the Grand Fleet is out. They don't know, uh, or the High Sea Fleet is out. They don't know the exact location, but they want to bring it to battle. Some wonderful paintings of the Battle of Jutland and of the two fleets. Again, these fleets uh, attracted a great deal of attention in both countries. It's often seen as theater, in fact. These great fleets came to represent British and German nationalism. Well, the High Sea Fleet steaming out being led by the battle cruiser force. Germany also built battle cruisers, and this is Admiral Franz Hipper. Um, again, a uh, wonderful representative of the leadership of the German Navy. He's a Bavarian, not a Prussian. He's a Catholic, not a Protestant. He's middle class, not an aristocrat. But he is promoted, why? Because he represents the technocratic elite of this new industrial Germany. Now, after the battle, he becomes uh, ennobled. He becomes Franz von Hipper. Uh, and as you can see, he's also awarded the Pour le Marit, uh, the Blue Max, the highest award that Germany could give its leaders for his role in Jutland. Uh, Hipper leads out the vanguard. Uh, on his staff, the man second from the left, if you look at him, you'll see that that's uh, Eric Rader who is going to become the head of the German Navy in the Second World War in the 30s uh, and uh, down to 1943 until Hitler fires him. Again, uh, here's a connection between the First War and the Second War. Raider is with the German battle fleet uh, at the Battle of Jutland. On the other side, the battle cruiser force that's in the vanguard of the Grand Fleet is commanded by Sir David, Admiral Sir David Beatty. And there's a typical pose of his with a uh, hand in his pockets and uh, looking right at you and his hat askance and the rest. Uh, someone who's going to be a dashing uh, figure and sees himself as being a dashing uh, figure. 
Again, very aggressive commander who wants to bring the Germans uh, to, to battle. And there, again, he is on the bridge of his, uh, his uh, flagship, the Lion. The man to the left is a uh, captain, his flag captain, uh, Ernley Chatfield, who is going to become first sea lord during the 1930s and preside over the buildup of naval power, British naval power, in the late 1930s. So again, the connection between the First World War and the Second. Now, one thing that I want to come get across here is when you look at Cher, when you look at uh, Jellicoe, when you look at Hipper, when you look at Beatty, uh, where are they? They're on the bridge of their ships. They're in the midst of the battle. They're under great danger. They can be killed in these fights. This is very, very different from what we uh, picture of the First World War on land, where generals are often derided as being chateau generals, far away from the front, out of danger. Uh, to understand what goes on at Jutland, you have to understand that these leaders are not only under great stress because of the responsibility, but they're actually in the thick of the action. Uh, Beatty's flagship, Lion, came very close to being destroyed, blown up at Jutland. Uh, he could have been killed. So the admirals are very much in the thick of the fight. Well, the two fleets, two battlecruiser forces, come across each other. Uh, Hipper, in command of the German battlecruiser force, scouting group one, decides to... Uh, this is great. Draw the British back toward the main German fleet. Meanwhile, Beatty, seeing the German battlecruisers, launches an immediate pursuit. He violates one of the principles of war, concentration of force. He has six battlecruisers plus four fast battleships of the 5th Battleship Squadron under Admiral Evan Thomas. Uh, Beatty decides to engage in such an impetuous way, charging at the Germans, that he doesn't close up his formation and close up these forces. In fact, through signaling errors, the 5th Battleship Squadron uh, is delayed in getting into the action. Inexcusable. Uh, anyway, Beatty decides to attack. He sees himself as having six battlecruisers against the five German battlecruisers, six to five, enough of a superiority, uh, plus the British battlecruisers have heavier ordnance, so he thinks that he can pull this one off. So he pursues. Uh, these are the battleships of the 5th uh, Battleship Squadron. By the way, these are the largest, most powerful battleships in the world at this time. Four battleships capable of doing 22, maybe 23 knots, uh, eight 15-inch guns that can outrange any any uh, uh, heavy artillery on the German fleet. Again, initially, they're not in the action. They're lagging behind. If they had been in the action from the very beginning, uh, their shell would have been able to tell on the uh, Germans. By the way, these ships tend to be fairly good shooters, too, better than the battlecruiser force. The battlecruisers, unfortunately, are not, um, uh, are not good shooters. More on that in a moment. Well, in the engagement, one of the British battlecruisers, uh, the HMS Indefatigable, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, is destroyed by German heavy gunfire. Uh, not only does Beatty engage before his whole force is ready, as they engage so quickly, uh, one of the German battlecruisers is not covered by, German f uh, by British fire. And so it is able to fire back without having to worry about being hit itself. Uh, how the indefatigable is lost, uh, there's some debate about it, um, uh, whether its armor was penetrated or not, uh, if the, this is most uh, is likely, but it could also have been done by magazine explosion caused by bad handling of ammunition and shell. Uh, more on that in a moment, too. Uh, about 20 minutes later, another battle cruiser, the Queen Mary, blows up, as you can see. By the way, off on the left is uh, Beatty's flagship Lion, also coming under heavy attack, having a uh, major explosion, to losing a turret, comes very close to being destroyed. Um, one of the things that happens in the Jutland story is that both Jellicoe and Beatty had decided that whenever there was going to be an engagement, that they wanted to have their ships fire as rapidly as possible. And as a consequence of that, some very sloppy handling takes place of loading of shell ammunition from magazines to turrets. Uh, it's now thought that at least two of the three battle cruisers that are destroyed at Jutland are due to this sloppy handling of ammunition and shell. In other words, the battle cruiser design 
was not at fault. What was at fault was the uh, 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 desire of the uh, British to have more rapid fire at this time. And it comes from the leadership, from Jellicoe and Beatty. One of the uh, stories that needs to be told about Jutland, uh, has been told, uh, is that after Jutland, both Beatty and Jellicoe do their utmost to try to cover up this story uh, um, and their responsibility uh, for it. Um, again, another painting now of the Queen Mary blowing up. Well, Beatty and Hipper are, are going uh, south. Beatty, by the way, seeing two of his uh, uh, six ships destroyed, his own uh, ship, uh, Lion, almost destroyed, turns to Chatfield and uh, this time says, there seems to be something bloody wrong with our ships today. Well, maybe so, uh, but it also might have been not so much the ships, but also the way they were handling shell. Um, Hipper has drawn Beatty down to Admiral Scheer's main force. Beatty then turns around. Again, poor signaling. The fifth battle ship squadron is exposed, slow to turn around. Boy, the Germans are, are getting a lot of luck here in this. This should never have happened. I mean, this is bad command on the part of Beatty, engaging with a force without concentrating his force, and then leaving the fifth battleship squadron to lag behind where uh, they come close to having to face the whole German battle fleet. Uh, this is Germany's great opportunity uh, uh, at the Battle of Jutland. Well, in the chase north now, Beatty is trying to draw the high sea fleet against Jellicoe's fleet, which is deploying now. Beatty is sloppy again in signaling. Jellicoe doesn't know the exact whereabouts of not only the German high sea fleet uh, and the German battlecruiser force, but also Admiral Beatty's force. Jellicoe is very frustrated by this, the lack of information, uncertainty that he faces uh, in this battle. He deploys his force, though, in a brilliant way, given the information at his disposal, and brings it, uh, a fo his force to the point where it really is crossing the T of the German force. Uh, Scher understands this, that he is now being engaged by a much superior force and runs away. He does the smart thing, turns away. In this part of the uh, action, there's some very heavy firing that takes place and another British battle cruiser, the HMS Invincible, is destroyed along with Admiral Hood. Again, it is now thought that like the Queen Mary, uh, that uh, the Invincible was destroyed because of sloppy shell handling, not because of the design of the battle cruisers. Uh, and there, as you can see, the, the Invincible broken. In the background, uh, the Grand Fleet is actually steaming by uh, there. Well, Cher is so <laughs> desperate to get back home, he now does something that, well, he shouldn't have done. He makes a turn back toward the British fleet. Not only is Jellicoe unaware, having trouble locating the enemy forces because of visibility and, and uh, poor scouting. But Cher, his situational awareness is also poor. So he inadvertently turns his fleet right back at Jellicoe. Well, uh, it's not before long in the so-called second engagement when uh, Jellicoe's forces start firing on Cher that Cher is, how do I get out of here? And so, uh, again, Cher does another major turnaway. In doing that, he also orders his destroyers to launch a torpedo attack on the Grand Fleet. Jellicoe then turns away to avoid this mass torpedo attack. So at one of the critical moments of the battle, you see both Cher and Jellicoe being decisive in turning away and running away from each other. Uh, again, this helps explain why the Battle of Jutland uh, ends up the way uh, it does. By the way, I think both leaders are correct in what they decide to do at this time, that preserving the force is uh, more important than the destruction of the enemy's force, because the odds don't look good that you'll be able to destroy the enemy's force by more aggressive action. Again, some paintings of the battle uh, uh, by Klaus Bergen here. German forces firing again, it captures well the poor visibility uh, uh, that goes on in the battle. Well, after this second engagement, Jellicoe tries to keep his force close to Cher, but he doesn't know exactly where Cher is, and he knows that Cher has two potential roads back home, given the minefields and the rest that are in the southern part of the North Sea. And so Jellicoe has to choose which one is it. Well, given that Cher's uh, course from the last engagement, 
indicated that he was heading, heading south, he thought, okay, the, one, uh, the choice on the left is the likely one. So Jellicoe positions his fleet, uh, steaming at nighttime, to try to intercept the German force on that, on that approach back home. Again, he expects that uh, at daybreak on June 1st that he'll be still between the German bases and the German high sea fleet. Now what Scher does though, at night though, is he decides to go the other way, to cut back. Now he ran a great risk here. He's already cut back once and put himself right in the midst of the Royal, of the, of the Grand Fleet, of the Royal Navy's Grand Fleet. Uh, this time he gets a little bit luckier. Uh, he's able to cut through behind the main force of, of Jellicoe. There's a lot of fighting that goes on there. Jellicoe, though, isn't aware of the intensity of the fighting. Plus, again, the 5th Battleship Squadron, which is now at the rear of the British line of Jellicoe's force, they actually see through the night, they actually see uh, what they can make out silhouettes of German battleships. Uh, in fact, the, the gunnery officer of the battleship Malaya says, I want to open fire on them. And the skipper says, no, 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 we're not supposed to have a night engagement, so we're not going to fire. We're not going to illuminate targets. Uh, well, at least let's pass this information down to Jellicoe. So he knows that, uh, get some new information that might indicate that Cher's going the other way. It's like, well, no, 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 the, the Admiral probably knows all of this stuff. And so some vital information is not passed along to Jellicoe that should have been passed along to him. As late as midnight, if he had uh, changed course, looping back north, he could have put himself in a position to intercept Cher on the morning of June the 1st. But instead, he continues on a southerly course, expecting to meet the Germans further south. Again, Scheer's force gets away. Uh, by the way, in the middle of the night, cutting through the German lines, uh, the Germans, who had every reason to conceal themselves, to not turn on their searchlights and the rest, uh, nonetheless do when they see tempting targets, uh, including British armored cruisers uh, that uh, German battleships then engage. Again, one of the reasons why the British don't open fire is that they want to conceal themselves by putting on your searchlights. You're making the enemy aware of where you are, and uh, they don't want a night engagement. The Germans had every reason, too, to avoid a night engagement in the sense of trying to escape. But again, when a target like this emerged, it was turn on the searchlights, open fire. Again, the Germans were lucky in this regard uh, that information, vital information, was not passed along to, uh, uh, to Jellicoe. Now, what about Jellicoe's handling of the fleet? He's criticized for not being aggressive enough, uh, to centralize his command and control, not uh, letting subordinates have more leeway in the Grand Fleet battle orders. Uh, well, Churchill, who is generally critical of Jellicoe, who doesn't like Jellicoe, nonetheless pens one of the most famous statements about Jellicoe's responsibility, that he was the only individual leader uh, on either side of generals, admirals, uh, or statesmen uh, who could lose the war in an afternoon. Again, the great responsibility that he had for the Grand Fleet. Because if the Grand Fleet is destroyed, well then the whole strategic contour of the war at sea changes. That Britain loses uh, that dominance at sea. That it needs to be able to continue the, the war. Ag again, this is something of a defense of uh, Jellicoe's risk-averse uh, behavior. Okay, who won? Right away, the big debate is who won. Well, there, there's the numbers. You know, if you look at the ships, the tonnage, uh, looks like the uh, Germans uh, won, if you measure it this way. Uh, what's fascinating about it is, is two of the German battle cruisers, the Moltke and Seidlitz, were so badly damaged. Uh, th th in fact, th they, they had to go it on their own to escape during the night. If they had been caught at sea by destroyers, British destroyers who throw a few torpedoes at them, they would have been lost. Uh, the the Seidlitz and Molke could well have been sunk in this battle. If you change that number around for German losses to three battle cruisers, something that should have happened, I would argue, then the battle doesn't look at all like uh, um, uh, as, uh, as if the British haven't done as well. Again, it's, it's very close what is happening here and the losses that both sides are suffering. Uh, and the reason why I want to highlight this is that there's a sort of a mythology out there that the Germans were just better than the British. 
And I say, no, that's not the case. The British are very good. They're inflicting a lot of damage on the German ships. Uh, the Germans are um, a, a little bit lucky in that those two battle cruisers escape. And I would also add, because of the poor handling of ammunition during the battle, that two of the three British battle cruisers that were lost probably would have been sunk if they had um, been following a more prudent way of handling shell and ammunition. So that number could have been changed to one battle cruiser rather than three. Again, you can play with these numbers and show that, that uh, the British fleet uh, uh, is inflicting as much punishment damage as the Germans uh, are in this. Well, right away, the Germans claim victory. And here's a painting that shows Kaiser Wilhelm on June 5th going to visit the fleet in Wilhelmshaven, give them a rousing speech. This speech generally has only one sentence that's been translated into English, which is that the aura of Trafalgar has been destroyed and the rest. Well, I, 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 I was on a quest. I wanted to actually find the whole speech. And my colleagues in the S&P department know that I, I went on a little quest for this. And I finally was able to get through our wonderful library on interlibrary loan, the collected speeches of, of Kaiser Wilhelm during the First World War. And so I, I did my translation of the speech. A and again, Wilhelm puts it in this larger contest of Germany striving for world power and Britain being that godlike figure that dominates the world and the world's oceans and that they've suffered a blow. And again, at last the day has come, the Tag. You know, and the British fleet, Albion, you know, that had dominated the oceans, imposed a tyrannical rule on the sea for over the whole world during the past hundred years since Trafalgar. Again, warn the Nimbus. This is often translated, uh, Nimbus is translated as aura. You know, um, I, I, I know that aura has a better sound in the English here, but he uses in the speech the word nimbus twice. It's a cognate, so I thought I had to keep it. Uh, and, and nimbus has that glow, like a crown, but it's the crown of a god. So the Kaiser is very specifically saying here, this foreign Jupiter with this glow. Now, well, it's come to an end. And what happened on the day of battle? The English fleet is beaten. Again, generally, it's only the last one that gets translated, the tradition of Trafalgar torn to shreds. Uh, I think this is the first English translation of a bigger chunk of the, of the speech, and so I'm most proud of that. <laughs> anyway, again, this hammer blow has been struck, and again, he uses the word nimbus, and it's English global domination. Again, that's what's at stake here at the Battle of Trafalgar and in the war at sea. It's not over something trivial, it's over something major. Who's going to be the dominant world power, Britain or Germany? Well, what's the response in Britain? Well, initially, it's very depressed. This is a, a painting of Lord Riddle, who is one of the big press barons, whose uh, papers, his diaries, he was an avid diary keeper, in, or also in the British Library in London. And what he writes down is, wow, we suffered a reverse. Jutland's a defeat. That's the initial view that's being held by the British elite. Fisher, who's no longer in power, no longer in uniform, on the sidelines, uh, he tells C.P. Scott, another press baron, the Manchester Guardian. Again, this is what Fisher is saying to the media elite uh, behind the scenes, not for the record, uh, is saying that, and again, you find this in the C.P. Scott diaries, again, also at the British Library. I have found, looking through the diaries and letters of the press barons of Lord Northcliffe, Lord Riddle, and C.P. Scott, very revealing because all the generals, admirals, and politicians want to talk to them and put a spin on it. And of course, they're keeping track of what's being said uh, to them. And Fisher says, this is a defeat. Why? Because we're superior to the Germans in numbers. I, I, this is an unsatisfactory result. Even if the losses were one to one, which they weren't, that would be a defeat as well. Again, the tradition of Trafalgar is the superior British fleet should have inflicted much heavier lopsided losses on the Germans rather than the outcome. Lloyd George, the up-and-coming man in the political scene, the most dynamic British political leader at the time, he's very upset about the news that he hears about Jutland. And again, he says to, uh, um, to Lord Riddle, uh, that um, 
that, uh, that the British have suffered a reverse and that he's really angry at the Admiralty. What's wrong with the Admiralty that they haven't produced a great victory? In fact, Lloyd George, who was in the countryside, was so upset by the news of Jutland that he gave up his golf game <laughs> and returned to London. There he is in a painting at Walton Heath with Lord Riddle. Again, where do you talk about politics? You do it on the golf course. And Lloyd George tells Lord Riddle, I can't play golf. We, we've suffered a defeat at sea. We ha I have to go back to London right away. So again, that's very serious when you give up your golf game in the countryside. Uh, meanwhile, the Prime Minister's wife is recording in her diary uh, what she thinks about this. And what has happened? The Germans have won the information game. They've gotten out the news ahead of time that they're the winner, that they have ga gained a triumphant victory uh, o over the British fleet. And it's not only in Germany, but they've getten, gotten this to America as well, uh, that they have, Britain has suffered a defeat. And meanwhile, Britain, we're incorrigible. We're not able to get our message out, our spin on this, uh, I, 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 again, that Britain is somehow losing the spin game of who won the battle. Well, who do the British turn to, to turn around the spin? Winston Churchill. Churchill is no longer in office. He had been forced out in May 1915 uh, from being first order of the Admiralty. Uh, in the end of 1915, he resigned his office, uh, another office that he had in the government, and went off to serve for five months as a lieutenant colonel in charge of a Scottish battalion on the Western Front. Imagine this, a cabinet minister who is now a lieutenant colonel uh, goes on raids uh, into no man's land several times comes close to being killed. On one occasion, uh, his dugout, his command dugout, was destroyed by German artillery fire. He fortunately was not in it at the time. Uh, well, anyway, uh, Arthur Balfour, the First Lord of the Admiralty, says, okay, how do we deal with the spin here? Well, he turns to Churchill and says to Churchill, can you write up some glowing report about the Battle of Jutland? Uh, not for the last time do you have Winston Churchill being called in to somehow turn defeat into victory. And he writes up a dispatch. He's given inside information and the rest, and this is uh, the most important part of it, was that one, the British are still in command of the world's seaways. The strategic effects of Jutland do not favor the Germans. And why wasn't there a Trafalgar? Well, the environment conspired against it. Hazy weather, fall of night, retreat, the enemy runs away. That alone frustrated what? Our brilliant commanders, Sir John Jellicoe and Beatty. In other words, no fault should be put on the admirals for this. Uh, again, Churchill plays a leading role in turning around the propaganda battle with regard to um, the um, Battle of Jutland. Well, what are the admirals saying about each other behind their back? Well, Jellicoe is telling his wife that Beatty doesn't have the experience enough and he's made a lot of mistakes. Again, you have to find this uh, uh, by looking at what Jellicoe's wife is saying. Jellicoe is not going to publicly say any of this, but this is what he's thinking. Meanwhile, Fisher, Admiral Fisher, goes to C.P. Scott, again a press baron, and says, you know what I want to call Beatty? I want to call him Balaclava Beatty. What does that mean? It's the charge of the Light Brigade at the Battle of Balaclava during the Crimean War, in which the Light Brigade is destroyed by Russian artillery fire. You know, a reckless leadership that puts their men, their capability, in harm's way, in a way that they're bound to be destroyed. And so Fisher is calling Beatty like uh, Lord Lucan or Lord Cardigan responsible for a military disaster, not for a victory on this. Again, behind the scenes, the admirals are being very catty uh, with each other. And by the way, you can also find in the letters of Admiral Beatty, what does Beatty think, uh, or Admiral Beatty's wife, uh, Ethel, who is uh, uh, an heiress of uh, the um, uh, Marshall Field uh, fortune, American. Uh, this is what she's writing to a friend. There seems to be very little to say uh, except to curse Jellicoe. Curse Jellicoe for not going at them in an aggressive way as her husband had done to annihilate the German fleet. He failed hopelessly. And not only that, but he doesn't tell the truth. He's trying to cover up 
why he wasn't aggressive enough and put the blame for the losses at Jutland on her husband. She doesn't like that, obviously. Well, what does Beatty think about all this? Again, here's the, the Beatty who, you know, is charging into battle and all the rest. Well, one of the takeaways he has from the Battle of Jutland is, I'm not doing that again. Uh, he succeeds Jellicoe as commander of the Grand Fleet at the end of 1916. Jellicoe is promoted to be first sea lord. So he goes back uh, to, to the center of things at the Admiralty. Well, anyway, on January 9th, 1918, Beatty writes this big, long appreciation, which is in the National Archives at Kew. And uh, it's hard to read it over there on the left, but that's what the title page looks like. Again, now he's in Jellicoe's shoes. And these are some of the big takeaways. In theory, the British still have a superior battle cruiser force. As he says, nine to six, a three to two edge. But in reality, Beatty thinks that there are only three battle cruisers that can really stand up to the Germans. That the reality is that the Germans actually outnumber the British in battle cruiser strength. He doesn't want to engage under those circumstances because the battle cruisers are supposed to clear the way for the main battle. So right away the British would fight uh, uh, at a disadvantage. In addition to that, one of the things that he sees as being a defect of the fleet, the Grand Fleet, was that the shell that the Grand Fleet had was not able to penetrate German armor. And until uh, the Grand Fleet gets better uh, uh, shell projectiles, that, uh, that they shouldn't engage the enemy. So at the earliest, the summer of 1918, is when the Grand Fleet should engage. So again, here's Beatty, the very dashing Beatty, you know, who's seen as wanting to bring on a battle against the Germans, no. Uh, he, he's content with the stalemate. And in, this is the concluding paragraph of uh, his appreciation in which he says, hey, uh, uh, right now the, the Grand Fleet, uh, the, the strategy of the Grand Fleet uh, is in, uh, no longer to endeavor to bring the enemy to action at any cost. This seems to be the exact antithesis of Lord Nelson and Trafalgar spirit. Again, Germ uh, uh, the British naval leadership, uh, Jutland is reinforcing their caution. Well, how about the German side? They've won this great victory, but no sooner is the battle over than Admiral Scher, the commander of the high sea fleet, says, you know, the battle fleet ain't the decisive weapon. The real decisive weapon in the war at sea is the U-boat. We have to turn to the U-boat. Here, uh, you know, the big buildup in Germany, the bells being rung, the Kaiser giving the rousing speech, and the Admiral saying, uh, we don't want to do that again, because if we do, we're going to get destroyed. So instead, what do you do? Well, you've got to get around the island chains. You know, the first island chain is uh, Silt, Helgeland, uh, and Borkum. The second island chain, you know, is England. The third island chain is uh, Ireland uh, up to Iceland. So uh, the British aren't going to come into the first island chain. It's too dangerous. Uh, the German fleet, battle fleet, doesn't want to go outside the first island chain. It's too dangerous. The British, by the way, don't really want to go inside between the first and second island chain either. But the U-boats, well, they're ready to go out and fight. And Germany now wants to unleash them out beyond the second and third island chain. It's often, uh, I often hear people when they talk about the Anglo-German naval war and rivalry, they say the Germans didn't come out and fight. Well, what they mean is they're talking about the high sea fleet doesn't come out and fight. The German Navy does come out and fight. It comes out and fights hard in this U-boat war. So there's another whole element to this war. It's a hybrid war, if you will, between the big surface fleets being in check with each other, but then also the more unconventional asymmetric fight of German submarines going against uh, 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 international shipping. Again, if uh, Germany as a battle fleet sinks uh, 111,000 tons of British warships in a single day at Jutland. Uh, in the submarine war, the uh, German submarines sink almost 13 million tons of shipping during the First World War. Again, represented, symbolized by the loss of the Lusitania in the spring of 1915. Again, you want to reach out beyond the first and second island chain to be able to go after uh, British shipping. Neil Ferguson, in an article in Foreign Affairs uh, several years ago, again highlighted that the loss of the Lusitania 
uh, to the U20 symbolizes an end of globalization. Again, something big is at stake here in this naval war. Well, Admiral Herzendorf, who is the chief of naval staff, equivalent of First Sea Lord, he's a big proponent of the submarine war, even though he knows that it will bring the United States into the war. Holzendorf apparently said to the Kaiser, yeah, I, the Americans won't even get over here if you unleash the U-boats. For the Germans, uh, uh, there's something of playing to German myth and culture. Uh, the Great Opera by Karl Maria von Weber, Der Freischutz. Uh, it's a story about hunters. It's for us English here, it's basically the silver bullet. Uh, the guy wants to get the girl, he has to win a hunting contest, and he sells his soul to, to the devil to be able to get the bullet that always hits its target. Again, that silver bullet. And so they forge that bullet. And, uh, of course, to do it, though, you have to compromise on your morals in some way to win. You're cheating. Wh why do I put this up here? Well, again, it, uh, this was Kaiser Wilhelm's favorite opera. You know, he's predisposed toward the silver bullet. You know, what is the sil silver bullet? Well, it's the U-boats. By the way, the German army leadership under Hindenburg and Ludendorff agree with the Navy. They put their weight behind the German Navy. And as you can see, hunters all, there you can see all the things that they're shooting behind them. The Kaiser was known, you know, for killing lots of animals and putting their antlers up all over in the hunting lodges and all the rest. So again, now they're going to go hunting of international shipping. Bettmann Holweg, he has his doubts, but he can't stand up to the military and naval leaders in this regard who have convinced the Kaiser to go over. The Kaiser is, hey, if Wilson wants war, then we'll have it. Well, initially, the German submarine campaign does well. Unleashed, unrestricted submarine warfare. As you can see, the tonnage being sunk goes up to alarming levels. Um, loss of ships beyond the uh, second and third island chain. Jellico, who's now first sea lord, uh, mismanages uh, the defense of British trade. This is a more serious flaw in his leadership than anything he does at Jutland. He's slow to introduce convoys. Uh, he's backed up by the new civilian head of the Royal Navy, Sir Edward Carson. Lloyd George is frustrated at the shipping losses, now Prime Minister. He moves to fire Jellicoe, first by firing, moving away Carson, and then bringing in a new First Lord, Sir Eric Geddes, who <laughs> fires Jellicoe on Christmas Eve, 1917, does it by sending him a letter. Even though they're in the same building, <laughs> Geddes won't walk over to Jellicoe's office. He sends him a letter saying, hey, it's time for you to go now. Uh, and we have somebody new here who's going to take over, Sir Rosalind Wester Wems, who serves out the rest of the war as First Sea Lord. Uh, most historians agree that Jellicoe had to go, but a lot of people think, ah, he was treated in a shabby way, being shown the door on Christmas Eve. You know, it's like, Merry Christmas, Jellicoe, and you're fired. Uh, well, anyway, Eric Geddes is a ruthless man. He was a businessman who made a great reputation in running railways. In fact, he unsnarled the British logistics behind the Western Front Railway earlier in the war. So he's a very competent man. And he saw in Jellicoe somebody who was not up to the task. And so Lloyd George was glad to have Gettys there to fire uh, Jellicoe. One more consequence of Jutland is that it spurs American naval development at this time. In the aftermath of Jutland, in August 1916, a major piece of legislation is passed in the United States to build up a Navy second to none. And I, I love this $2 bill that shows a battleship, probably the New York, on the reverse side. Woodrow Wilson understands that because of the war that the United States has to build up its Navy. And in February 1916, he gave a speech in St. Louis. And that's uh, the takeaway from that. There is no other Navy in the world that has to cover so great an area of defense as the American Navy. And the U.S. has to have, in his judgment, incomparably the greatest Navy in the world. Boy, that sounds like Kaiser Wilhelm and Tirpitz uh, here. And indeed, there is a buildup that takes place. We were going to build battle cruisers, six big battle cruisers, over 40,000 tons with eight 16-inch guns. 
Of course, they, uh, Lexington and Saratoga, two of those battle cruisers, instead of being battle cruisers, were turned into these two large fleet carriers after the Washington Naval Conference of 21-22. Well, uh, as everyone predicted, the German submarine offensive uh, brings the U.S. into the war. That's Woodrow Wilson, by the way. The commerce warfare is warfare against mankind. And on Good Friday, 1917, Wilson asked for a declaration of war, which is voted by the Congress, the United States, the return of the Mayflower, providing naval support, a battleship squadron to Beatty's force at Scapa Flow, Admiral Sims going over to take command of American naval forces in European waters. One of the things I came across in his papers is a letter he wrote to his wife uh, in which he has dinner with Winston Churchill. Uh, in the letter, he highlights that last night he had dinner with Lady Randolph Churchill, who's Winston Churchill's mom. Winston Churchill's mom, Lady Randolph, is uh, an American. She was born in Brooklyn. Um, there she is in 1917. Well, anyway, she invited her son, Winston, who had been First Lord of the Admiralty. That's what Churchill looked like in 1917. It's a painting from the year before, 1916. Sims and Churchill had a long talk. And what does he say? The Allies, meaning Britain, would have been beaten if America had not come into the war. Again, one of the key elements to understand Second World War strategy is that Churchill sees the U.S. playing a key role in Britain's ability to defeat Germany in the two world wars. Well, with the introduction of convoys, what you can see from the graphs as convoys come in, German sinking losses go down, the submarine gamble, the Verbank on the part of the German leadership, betting the house, it doesn't work, it brings the U.S. into the war. And if you look at GDPs, that's the U.S. GDP in relation to Britain and to Germany. Again, Germany has now brought in a very powerful actor against it. That associated power now lined up with the Allies. And by the end of 1918, over two million American soldiers uh, in France. Okay, so what? What are some of the big takeaways? for us today. Well, here's a couple. One, the pre-war arms race largely predetermined the Battle of Jutland. Uh, Germany's not going to win the, any Battle of Jutland unless the British mess up big time. The, the surface uh, uh, engagements, uh, Germany shouldn't be able to win. It just shouldn't. And uh, again, it's already determined before the battle has been fought. It's only reckless behavior like Beatty engaged in give the Germans any opportunity at all to equalize things. So that has to be kept in mind. The day of battle is determined largely by what happens before. Um, it's often said about Jellicoe that Jellicoe uh, was a leader who had a flawed cutlass. In other words, the Royal Navy wasn't as good as the Germans in some way. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think, uh, you know, it's a wash. In some ways, the Germans were better than the British. In many ways, the British were better than the Germans when it comes to fire control, shell, all the rest. Uh, so I, I think what you have to look instead is how about the leaders? Well, again, the, the pressure put on rapidity of fire explains uh, some of the losses at Jutland on the British part. So it's more leadership failure if you want to look at what's wrong with the Royal Navy at Jutland rather than the ships themselves. Uh, again, it highlights how important it is to have leaders who um, uh, are uh, adept, able to adapt uh, at changing conditions of war uh, at, at this time. Uh, another thing to take away from Jutland is just the lethality of naval warfare. Look at the number of ships sunk in a single day at Jutland. It could have been worse if Cher and Jellicoe had behaved in a more aggressive way. Again, those are heavy losses, but they're heavy losses uh, that are the outcome of a battle in which leaders are being risk averse. What if they hadn't been risk averse, willing to take on more risk? There would have been even greater losses uh, at, at Jutland. Again, how much uncertainty there was and how uncertainty colored the risk assessments uh, of uh, Jellicoe in this. Again, with greater information, he would have been willing to take on uh, more risk. Um, and finally, the day after. One of the things I want to get across from this presentation today is that by focusing too much on the day, on the day of battle, 
you lose sight of the larger rivalry between Britain and Germany, which goes back to the 1890s and would go on to 1918, 19, and indeed would surface again in the Second World War. So you have to look at the longer, longer tide of history in this regard, of a longer rivalry between these countries. By focusing on one day, you're not seeing the bigger picture of what's going on, the dynamic here of rivalries for world power between these two empires, the German Empire and uh, Britain. In addition, by focusing so much on the day of battle, you forget all the other things that are taking place in the naval war at this time. Lots of operations, not only of submarines and destroyers and merchant ships and mine layers that are going on. It, it uh, takes us away from a lot of the naval warfare that's going on. The fleet that Britain had had to be prepared not only to fight on the day, but also on the day after and the day after that and the day after that. Again, the war comes to a crisis at sea with the submarine campaign, uh, the submarine offensive is as important, more important to study when it comes to failure of command in Britain than the Battle of Jutland. That's more important. So again, you have to see not just focusing on the episodes, as Churchill would say. You have to look at the longer trends, the tendencies as well. This is a big attrition war at sea. Is a fleet able to not only fight on the day of battle, but continue to fight on the day after as well? So I think that is one of the most important takeaways from studying the Battle of Jutland, is not just focus on, on this one day of battle, but to look at the war as a whole and how important it is to command the maritime commons over the longer haul. The Battle of Jutland, again, was determined largely by the pre-war rivalry going the way it was. It was determined by Britain's willingness and ability to stay ahead of Germany in a naval arms race before the battle was fought. And on that, I'll close and take any questions that uh, you all have.